Let's take a look at the characteristics of life. Now think about how do you know if something is alive? If something is alive, it will show these six characteristics that you see right here with the little circles, the little bullet points beside them. The first one is organization. Look at any individual organism, a dog, a person, a horse, a particular type of plant, whatever. They all have a common organization. That's largely how we recognize them and know what, we, what they are. You look at all people, dogs, whatever, they generally look alike. Of course, there's lots of differences, but you know how to recognize a dog by how it's organized. Metabolism, all the chemical reactions occurring in every living cell of the body. It's a countless number. There will always be two different types of chemical reactions. Synthesis, which are the building, and also the decomposition, which is the breaking down. We'll see a lot more of those further in the chapters. Responsiveness, organisms which are alive, tend to respond to their environment. They tend to move towards the things that they need and away from things which might be harmful. The next one, growth. You see growth in everything. Even if it's a single cell, it changes in size throughout its life. If they didn't get larger every time they divided, they'd eventually get so small, wouldn't be enough room inside the cell to maintain life. So you always see some growth. Most all the time you think about organisms, you see many more cells being made, that's usually how it happens, but even with the one-celled organism, they still have to grow. Development, you see enormous changes in organisms throughout their lifespan. If you look at like humans going from one cell to the trillions we have inside of us, there are so many changes that occur. We'll look at some of those throughout all these chapters. And then lastly, reproduction. No organism lives forever. So if it's going to continue to live, some form of reproduction will have to occur. Next, let's look at homeostasis. This is a very important topic inside the body. You're going to talk about homeostasis over and over and over throughout these chapters, because when you do, you're talking about keeping a relative constant environment inside your body. If you don't do this, you're probably not going to live for very long. Think about things like your body temperature, water balance, blood sugar levels, whatever. If any of those variables get away from an ideal set point very much for very long, you're not going to live. So we got to maintain this relative constant environment inside our body. We want to function normally. Now for each one of these important variables, we'll look at several of them here in a second, there'll be an ideal set point. Think about like for body temperature, 98.6 is what you'll see for most people. But there's a little bit of a range that you can operate in and still be okay, as long as it doesn't get away from that ideal number too much for too long. What keeps us at homeostasis are these two different types of feedback systems in the body, positive and negative. Now, of those two, almost all are of the negative type. You're not going to see many positive at all. Now, look at what these two feedback mechanisms are. Negative feedback is when your body goes against a deviation. In other words, you've gotten away from one of these ideal set points and the body doesn't like it, so it works against it to bring you back to that set point. If you get hot, your body causes you to sweat. That cools you down. If you get cold, causes you to shiver, brings you back up. Point being, whatever the deviation is, your body tries to go back against it in the opposite direction. That's negative feedback. Now, the positive is when the body goes with the deviation and allows it to get larger and larger. You won't see many examples of positive feedback because there's very few times the body wants to allow a deviation from homeostasis. But we'll look at an example or two of that further along. Look at the different components you see involved with homeostasis. you got to have some type of receptor that's, first of all, telling the body something's wrong. You've gotten away from this ideal set point. Think about sensory receptors for body temperature. We'll see more of those in a future chapter. You gotta have a control center, generally the brain, monitoring all these values. And once it sees that something is away from that ideal value, you're gonna have an effector in the body that helps to correct it. In other words, let's go back to body temperature. Say a receptor determines that your body temperature is getting too cool. Your body temperature drops by just one degree brain's not going to like that. It's going to cause your muscles to shiver, and that rapid contraction produces heat, brings your temp back up. It's negative feedback. You're going against a deviation once again. So we'll see examples of different stimuli, the receptors, and all the effector organs further along. Now looking back again at some of these examples, look at body temperature once again. 
Think about what happens if you heat up in the summertime. You get outside in the hot sun and you start to have this increase in temperature, getting above 98.6. Body can do a lot of things. The sweating we mentioned before, it can also dilate blood vessels in the skin. Blood moves heat around the body. If you bring more blood close to the surface, and that water evaporates off the skin when you sweat, it'll pull that heat with it. So as you bring more blood to the surface, you bring more heat to the surface and you lose it. If you're hot, that's one thing you definitely want to do. If you get too cold, again, body shivers. That produces heat, warms you back up. Water balance. If you get low on water, brain tells you you're thirsty. Again, that's going against the deviation. If you get too much water in you, kidneys get rid of the excess. Again, going against the deviation. pH balance is all about how much hydrogen ion is in you. This has a lot to do with protein function and structure. And of all these variables of homeostasis, your body temperature and your pH balance are the two most important ones. They're going to keep the proteins in your cells just the right structure, and that's going to allow them to perform whatever function that may be. Blood pressure. Your pressure gets too high. Your heart may slow down, bring it down. Blood pressure gets too low. Hard to breathe fa big faster to bring it up. Again, that's negative feedback. Body's going against the deviation. Blood sugar levels. Your glucose gets too low. Brain tells you you're hungry. They get high. Brain tells you you're not hungry there. Still going against the deviation. Again, that's negative feedback. Very seldom do you ever want to allow your body to get away from the ideal value of whatever the variable may be. That's just some of them listed right up here at the top. So we mentioned that left with the blood pressure and the kidneys holding water and so on down the line. But let's look at an example of positive feedback. Now again, this is where the body allows the deviation and actually allows it to get bigger and bigger. About the only time you really see this in the body is with a few hormones, and oxytocin is a good example. Oxytocin is a hormone responsible for a few different things. Labor contractions is a big one. So here's what happens. You look at a female, ordinarily oxytocin levels are very low. But if a pregnancy occurs, the baby will start to grow inside of a hollow muscular organ called the uterus. And as that baby grows, that'll stretch the muscle of that uterus around it. And the stretching of that muscle in that uterus is one thing that'll tell the pituitary gland to release oxytocin. So the bigger the baby gets and the more the muscle is stretched, the higher the oxytocin levels rise. That's a deviation away from what's normal, and the body will allow that deviation to get larger and larger. Now, eventually, negative feedback is going to shut off the positive. And here's where it'll happen with this example here. Once those oxytocin levels get high enough, They'll cause labor contractions. The uterine muscle will contract. The baby will be expelled. And when it's no longer in the uterus stretching that muscle, the oxytocin levels drop right back down. So that's the negative feedback shutting it back off. But again, positive does occur in a few occasions, but only for so long. So that's just the beginning of our discussions there. And here are the links to the study guides found on Amazon.